I'm super excited to be kicking off this conference today. Number one, because you can only go up from here. So even if you absolutely hate my talk, it's okay. There's about 10 other amazing speakers after mine. And also, it's not tomorrow when you're hungover from all the wine. So hopefully you're properly caffeinated, you're excited for today. A big shout out to Shauna and the team. I know there was some, you know, venue switches and last minute stuff, but I think they did an amazing job. And I, I, I did not picture this when they said it was in a church, and this is an amazing room. So I uh, hope you're all excited to be here. I've already annoyed the AV team by making my presentation in PDF, so hopefully this clicker works. We're going to try it. Um, so I'm talking to you today about chatbots, and I'm very excited about that because I'm very jazzed about chatbots. Uh, first, I thought I'd start by... Okay, I'm, I'm going to do the point instead, if that's okay. So you already heard a bit about me. Uh, I am uh, run an agency in Toronto. I used to work in startups for about 10 years, and I was named to Marketing Magazine's 30 Under 30 in 2012, although I just found out our next speaker was named to it last year and is still under 30, so that really annoys me, but that's okay. <laughs> can gun for 40 under 40, uh, but my biggest claim to fame on the bottom right-hand side here is that I was retweeted by Oprah not once, but twice, and there is the screenshot to prove it. I tried to email her to, to tell her to give me a job after that uh, happened, and she never responded, so no, I can't get you an interview with Oprah, no, we're not best friends, but I am working on it. Okay, and a little bit about 88 Creative. Um, we're a small agency, we work with a lot of startups in Toronto. You might have heard of us from our internal campaign that we launched called Agency or Porn. Uh, there are sound effects, so if you're Googling it right now, please be careful. Uh, but it's a, it's a microsite that asks you to decide whether the name of something is an advertising agency or an adult film, which is actually more difficult than you might think. Uh, and it was a really fun campaign, and yes, our senior designer had very questionable search history after researching for this project. So, what are we here to talk about today? We're here to talk about chatbots. Uh, how many people in the room have heard the term chatbots? Keep your hand up if you think you could intelligently explain what they are. Okay, this is good. For everyone with their hand up, you can just, you know, head out, have a coffee, come back in in 45 minutes. Uh, just kidding. So I'm going to start with the definition of a chatbot and tell you what they actually are. Uh, and then just to give you a sense of the agenda, I'm going to walk through uh, why right now is the perfect time to be launching a chatbot. Then I'm going to get into some brand examples of how people are using them. And then I'm going to tell you the all important how to build your own bot and whether you actually should after you leave here today. So a chatbot is a, sorry, back one slide, yeah, a chatbot is a piece of software designed to simulate human conversation. So if you think about uh, Siri or Samantha from the movie Her, those are almost like verbal chatbots. A chatbot, by definition, is uh, text-based, but it really is designed to simulate having a conversation with a human, but it's actually a robot. Uh, and these, they often include artificial intelligence and machine learning. So not every chatbot is built using AI. Often they're just built using scripts, so stuff that you write, and data, but they can include artificial intelligence. So those are the bots that actually get smarter as you use them. So chatbots live in a variety of places. They can live in SMS, so through text messages, um, so, for example, text 555 to, you know, get $5 off your next pizza. They can live inside messaging apps like Facebook Messenger or Kik, and they can also live on social networks. So I remember back in 2008, when I started using Twitter, there was a poutine bot that, if you mentioned the word poutine, would retweet you every single time. And it actually is scary how much I mentioned the word poutine on Twitter in 2008, um, but that was one of the earliest examples I saw of a chatbot. So just uh, to give you a sense of my background in bots, I was on a panel last year for Social Media Week in Toronto about bots, and that really opened my eyes, doing the research for that event, it really opened my eyes to the power of chatbots. But it wasn't until I read an article by the founder of Kik, which is a messaging app based in Waterloo, really popular with the teens, so if you don't know what it is, you're probably over the age of 25. And this article by Kik founder Ted Livingston kind of really illustrated the power of bots. So, First, I'll start off with um, a scenario. So you go to the Blue Jays game, you sit down, what's the first thing you do? You go get a drink, you order a beer. So typically, you'd either wait for the guy to come by your row, you'd hail down a drink, or you'd walk up to the stands and you'd wait in line there, you'd get a beer, and you'd go back to your seat. 
Now instead, picture on the back of your seat, there's a sticker that says, download the Rogers Center app to order a beer directly to your seat. And you're thinking, this is great. I don't have to leave my seat. I don't have to go wait in line. I don't have to carry cash on me. This is awesome. So you navigate to your app store of choice, the Google Play Marketplace or the iOS app store, and you download the Rogers Center app. You open the app, you uh, create an account, you log in, you navigate to the screen that says how many beers you want, you navigate to the screen that says what seat you're in, what row you're in, you enter your credit card information, and you place your order. And that probably took you about 10 minutes, and you were probably better off just walking up to the stands to get yourself a beer. Now picture a scenario where bots entered into the equation. So now picture a code that you would scan using Facebook Messenger on the back of the seat in front of you, and you would simply chat to the chat bot, hey, I'd like two beers in section 121, row seven, seat two. Facebook already has, they've developed a, a payments beta that allows you to actually store your credit card information in Facebook Messenger. So it already has your payment details on file and it's in a platform that you already use, Facebook Messenger. So in about 10 seconds, those beers are on their way to you. And Ted actually says that they're called invisible apps and that really helped illustrate it to me. In that article he said, this is an instant interaction and it is something that only becomes possible with bots. There's no new app to download, no new account to create, and perhaps most importantly, no new user interface to learn. So that helped, under, helped me understand the power of bots, it helped me understand why we should be using them. Uh, but the bigger question is, why are they so popular right now? I'm sure even if you don't know what a chatbot is, you've seen a million headlines in tech publications and marketing publications talking about them. Well, there's three factors that are really combining to make now the perfect time to build a chatbot. The first is the decline of native mobile apps. So I wanted to do a survey. How many people in the room have downloaded a new app on their smartphone in the last day? Okay, in the last week, in the last month. Keep your hands up. Okay, keep your hand up if you use that app that you downloaded every day. Okay, and thus illustrates part of the problem. So um, for all the Americans in the room, I have an American stat for you because I couldn't find the Canadian one. Uh, the average American downloads less than one new app per month. So that's probably about 10 apps per year. And of all of those apps that are downloaded, a quarter of them are abandoned after first use. So we all have the apps on our home screen that we use all the time, social networks, content sites, uh, banking, whatever that might be. But there are, you know, it's a hassle to download more apps. You probably have this app screen graveyard that's like two or three screens in where you never go in there, you don't use them. And for developers, this is really tough because it's hard to, first of all, rise to the top of the app store. It's really hard to make money off of apps these days if you're not Candy Crush. And it's also just really hard to, uh, to, to break through the noise of all of the apps out there. So that's kind of the first factor that is, is leading to the rise. The second is the rise of messaging apps. How many people in the room have used Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, or Kik on a daily basis? Well, you're not alone. So there are 1.9 billion combined users right now on Facebook and WhatsApp, which is a chat app that Facebook owns. And that's projected to grow to 3.6, if I remember, yep, 3.6 billion in the next few years. So about half of the world's population will be actively using a messaging app in the next few years. Um, and people are already using them today. So again, chatbots live inside messaging apps, so it's really easily accessible. And as this number grows, people are gonna be embracing chatbots more. And the third reason uh, that they're kind of growing in popularity is that there's a rise in bot stores. So here's a little bit of a timeline just to give you an idea. Uh, think of the iOS app store. So you could have built a native mobile app in 2006, but you really wouldn't have had anywhere to put it other than maybe on the BlackBerry. The launch of the App Store changed that. It gave developers a place to put their apps, it gave them a way to monetize them, and it gave consumers a way to discover them. And the same thing is happening with the launch of bot stores. So a messaging app called Telegram launched the first bot store in June of 2015. And then last year we saw a bunch of people jump into the mix. So Kik launched their own bot store last April. Facebook launched its, uh, its bot framework and bot tools and bot store in April at its F8 conference. Microsoft in last March launched their bot framework to make it really easy for developers to build chatbots. 
And a few months after Kik launched its, uh, its bot store in August of 2016, over 1.8 million messages had been sent back and forth between consumers and bots, and there were about 20,000 bots launched on the bot store. So native apps are declining, messaging apps are on the rise, and it's easier than ever if you're a brand to make a chatbot accessible, and if you're a consumer to find them. Next slide, please. Uh, and Facebook Messenger is probably one of, going to be one of the biggest hotspots for chatbots. And as of September of last year, there were over 30,000 bots on the Facebook uh, Messenger platform. And the, uh, the final stat that I'll go over, next slide please, is that Messenger's bot development platform is growing 70% faster than development in the iOS App Store, and there are double the number of bot developers than there are app developers today. So that's a pretty crazy stat, considering we're still pretty early in the hype curve of chatbots. So next I'm going to talk about uh, oh, one last quote here, uh, an article in Recode said, part of the appeal of bots is that they simply automate things that companies are currently paying humans to do. Which brings me to the next part of my talk, which is the opportunity for marketers. Um, how many people in the room are entrepreneurs who are doing their own marketing? How many people are on a larger brand marketing team? And how many people have had a conversation internally about bots? Not about building one necessarily, but what they are, OK, so a few of you. I'm assuming that number is going to go up in the next year. Uh, next slide, please. And someone from, um, and sorry, this slide is all the brands that are currently using it. So it's actually pretty crazy to look at the Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 brands that are actually using chatbots today already. Brands like Whole Foods, Taco Bell, I'm going to talk about them later, Shopify, Uber. So big brands are already jumping on the bot bandwagon. Um, and it, it, it is going to hit the mainstream in the next few years. Uh, and Sarah Marion from Anovia Capital, which is a Canadian VC firm, wrote an article in VentureBeat recently, and she said, chatbots enable brands to simultaneously reach millions of users while letting users choose inputs and engage in a personalized conversation relevant to their specific interests and demographics. This is the real power of bots for marketers. If you think about a billboard, it's one piece of creative that's launched to thousands or millions of people at once. A bot is the complete opposite. It provides every single consumer that your bot interacts with, with a completely unique and personalized experience, but allows you to do it in a completely automated way. So that's really the power of bots. And now I'm going to walk through a few ways that we've seen brands using them today. As we go through this, think about the pain points that you have in these areas in your own business and if there might be an opportunity to add a chatbot in. So the first is customer service. Customer service is where I see the most potential for bots uh, changing the way that we do business. And people always ask, you know, are the robots coming to take our jobs? Well, the answer is probably eventually, probably not in our lifetime, uh, but they're definitely coming to take customer service jobs, or at least to take some of the customer service jobs. And I mean, think about the power of bots in this situation. How many people have had a terrible conversation waiting on hold for an hour with an airline or with your telco company, you're navigating the, uh, the dial-in number and the menu and you want to jump off a cliff. Well, in a, the scenario with a bot, imagine opening up your Facebook Messenger and chatting with Roger's bot or Telesbot, and saying, hey, Telesbot, um, I know we have some Telus peeps in the audience here today. Hey, Telesbot, can you tell me what, the, uh, what the, my last bill was? OK, perfect. Can you charge that to the credit card on file? Uh, also, I'm going to New York next week, and I need to add a travel pack. These are all things that you could easily do in a 30-second chat with a chatbot on Facebook Messenger that already has your account details stored, that knows your history, and you have a record of that conversation very easily if you ever needed to go back to them. So we've already seen brands like Barclays Bank using this for customer service. So if you think about banking, hey, um, I'd like to open a new checkings account, or why was this interest charge in there, and being able to get answers really quickly. Uh, Twitter actually just launched a new tool that allows brands to create series of automated responses using chatbots in their DMs. So for example, if you are 
TELUS, and you have a lot of people reaching out to you on Twitter for customer service, Twitter now allows you to create automated responses. So if I send a tweet or a direct message to TELUS, they can write a scripted series of tweets that say, thanks for getting in touch. Our common response time is one to two hours. If you'd like a faster response, please call our customer service line, have your account number ready, all of those types of things you can automate and send to customers so they're prepared and they have a bit more knowledge when they're going into a customer service experience with you. One of my favorite examples of bots uh, is Slackbot. So does anyone in the room use Slack? I'm sure lots of you do. Uh, so Slackbot is probably the best example, if you use that tool, of a bot and how it can be used for customer service. We typically think about customer service in you know, solving problems, or I have an issue and I have a question. Slackbot is all about onboarding. So Slack has a Slackbot that automates the process when you log on, and it allows you to quickly chat with it and understand how to use the platform. So it's not just for customer service issues and responding to complaints, but also onboarding for your product or things like that. And they said, uh, Gartner's actually predicting that 85% of, uh, sorry, can you go back one second? I tried to memorize all these stats, guys, but I didn't. 85% uh, of customer interactions will be managed without a human by 2020. So think about that and how a chatbot can really work into that. I'm not saying fire your customer service team tomorrow. I don't want to be responsible for that. But think about if you can augment what you're currently doing. And even for some of those simple, lower hanging fruit requests that you know can be automated, this is a great place that you can, can look for that with chatbots. The next area that you can really look to for bots is content. So I'm not sure if we have any publishers in the room, any entertainment companies, but chatbots are a great way to push out content in a curated, personalized way. So one of the first bots that I interacted with was the CNN bot. So CNN allows you to chat with its bot on Facebook Messenger and say, um, you know, I'm interested in news about Canada and Kim Kardashian and the Super Bowl. And it will automatically push you articles in your Facebook Messenger chat that pertain to those topics. Getting too many? That's okay. Hey, CNN bot, only send me one article a day. Or send them all at one time. So you can kind of customize how you prefer to receive content. One of my favorite apps on my, my iPhone is the Global Mail app, because I get push notifications every time something interesting happens. This could be an alternative to that. So instead of receiving a push notification on my iPhone, I'm receiving a message in my Facebook Messenger inbox. Um, another example could be movie companies. So for example, if you're Sony and you have a huge catalog of musicians and movies, uh, or Netflix, let's say, with tons of content, I always you know, get into arguments with, um, with my boyfriend because it takes me 45 minutes to pick something to watch on Netflix, and it's the 2017 equivalent of standing in front of the VHS wall at, at Blockbuster and deciding what to watch. Imagine you had a chatbot where you could very easily say, hey, Netflix, uh, what's your top-rated documentary right now? Hey, Netflix, I really like the minimalist documentary. What else would you recommend? How much easier and how many fights would it save if we could actually just use a chatbot for that? Or we could say to Sony's catalog, show me all of the best picture winners that I can rent on iTunes right now. Uh, so if you have any kind of company that puts out content, maybe it's blog posts, right? Maybe HubSpot builds, uh, I know we have a speaker from HubSpot tomorrow, if they built in a chatbot that allowed you to push out new blog posts that you're putting out, or white papers, or eBooks, if you're a B2B company, via um, chat or chatbots, that could also be really cool. So the next bucket is shopping and e-commerce. This is actually one where I see a ton of potential as well. And chatbots are really great at getting people down the path to purchase. So if you think about an example, um, I'm going to talk about a case study about Sephora later, but a big retailer who has thousands of products, whether it's Walmart or Nordstrom, they have so many products that it's hard to, to find what you're looking for often. So chatbots are a really great way to curate those products and get personalized recommendation. So Nordstrom, uh, you actually can't use it to find Ivanka Trump's stuff anymore, which is a kind of a good thing, but uh, Nordstrom before the holidays launched a gifting chatbot. So the purpose was, you know, tell us who you're shopping for, um, what kind of person is this, do they like travel, if they could travel, where would they go on vacation? It would ask you questions about who was on your wish list and uh, personality traits about them, and then it would recommend actual products that you should be buying that for them. And the ROI question you know, doesn't really come into play here because you can click right through and buy the product directly from Facebook Messenger. 
Uh, another example is American Eagle. So they released a similar uh, chat bot for gifting where it said, you know, who are you shopping for? Uh, this person is my spirit animal because they are shopping for themselves at the holidays, which is great. Uh, but it allows you to, you know, it asks you fun questions like, do you like to treat yourself or do you like to spoil your BFF? So their audience is a bit younger. The chat bot has a bit of a fun personality. But again, it's trying to guide you down the path to purchase. So if you are an e-commerce company, if you are any sort of company selling products, multiple SKUs preferably, this is a really great way to actually promote your products and to get people in an automated way down the path to purchase. Shopify actually has a tool that allows you to build a chatbot pretty easily for your store. So if you are with an e-commerce platform like that, look into whether they already have a framework or a plugin that helps you build your own bot. Next is offers and promotions. Next slide, please. So, um, Think of Expedia or think of Groupon. Chatbots are a really great way to serve up deals, discounts, coupons, or to help you actually navigate deals. So there's actually a startup out of Toronto called Snap Travel, and they've built their entire business on chatbots. Their company is a chatbot on Facebook Messenger that is basically like Expedia put into chatbot mode. So you can say, you know, I'm going to, in this example, it says, you know, what are your city and your travel dates? And they're saying New York, May 3rd to 5th, max $350 budget. And then they're getting back with suggestions on the hotels they should be booking. And again, you can click right through and book the hotel from there. So any sort of offers, promotions, you can see how if you're running, say, an e-commerce store, and again, these don't have to be separate chatbots. You could have one chatbot for your e-commerce store that does multiple things, that pushes out content when you publish it, that allows allows people to get suggestions on products, and that pushes out offers and promotions, Black Friday sales or Boxing Day sales or things like that. The next area is smart assistance. This is probably the one that we're most familiar with today because of tools like Siri and uh, Google Now and Samantha from the movie Her. Um, I, I can't guarantee that you won't fall in love with your chatbot, but I don't think it's as realistic. They don't have Scarlett Johansson's voice. Uh, but smart assistants are going to be a really emerging area for chatbots. The, most, the best example of this is Facebook M. So Facebook launched a smart assistant chatbot last year that allows you to basically do anything. Find out what's on your calendar for the day, buy flowers for a coworker, find out what the weather is or the last night's sport, sports scores were. But instead of having to go, hey Siri, what were last night's sports scores, you can just easily chat with Facebook M. But it's not perfect yet. Facebook M actually has a team of humans who actually fulfill requests. So if I chat to Facebook M and say, hey, Facebook M, I really need some tacos from Taco Bell, but they don't deliver. Can you, can you order them and I'll go pick them up? Um, they actually have a person that's calling Taco Bell. So it's not completely automated yet, but Facebook is kind of dipping their toes into the smart assistant space. But think, for example, if your business is in the travel industry, you own a hotel like White Oaks that we're all staying in, um, could you have a concierge chatbot that allows people to book dinner reservations, get local recommendations, and almost acts as a smart assistant for anyone staying in that hotel? Or if you're American Express and you have a concierge service uh, that helps people get movie tickets or front of the line access, this could be a really great way for you to launch a concierge, smart assistant style chatbot. The next area is bookings and notifications. So I saw this firsthand last year when I went to South Africa and I booked my flight on KLM and they had a chatbot. And so, you know, I, I loaded the chatbot on Facebook Messenger and then I got a, a notifications throughout my travel process. So, you know, it popped up in, with a message that said, hey, your flight's now available for check-in. Hey, uh, you're at gate so-and-so. Hey, your flight's on time. Don't worry, everything's good. So it was actually really convenient because instead of having to go on the website and check the travel notifications, I was getting messages in real time from KLM telling me the status of my flight. Uh, this could also work really well for things like bookings. So imagine if someone like OpenTable had a bot that allowed you to just message and make a restaurant reservation. Hey, I want to go to this restaurant on Friday night for two people at 7.30. The bot could tell you the availability. Mm, we only have 8 o'clock. Make the reservation for you using your OpenTable account. Super simple. Uh, and there's already companies using this, like I mentioned, KLM, and Uber actually has a chat bot. If you haven't deleted Uber because of the whole Trump scenario, um, you can actually use Facebook Messenger to order your car. 
So, the final one, and the one that I have the most experience with, is marketing campaigns. And I mean this in two senses. The first could be um, you know, a marketing campaign around something that you're launching, and the second could be launching a chatbot because you just know that it's going to get you PR coverage and buzz because it's early in the hype cycle. So on the next slide, you can see one example on the left, which is the movie Zootopia, which I unfortunately didn't see, and I also didn't play this game on, on chatbots, but they actually released a chatbot that allowed people to go through and play games and go through challenges and see advanced content from the movie. So it was kind of an added experience around the movie that people could interact with on a chatbot. So that's an example of a marketing campaign uh, where you're actually promoting a specific thing. And then on the right, we have Kiabot. How many people watch the Super Bowl? A lot of us. How many people like me only watch for Lady Gaga? <laughs> Thank you for admitting it. Um, so Kia, actually, this is a recent example. They launched a bot that uh, the only purpose of it was to release its Super Bowl commercial. So they launched this Kia chatbot, and if you wanted to see Kia's Super Bowl commercial with Melissa McCarthy before the Super Bowl itself, you had to go on its chatbot, interact with it, and actually get the commercial delivered that way. Is this solving a problem? Absolutely not. But did they get coverage on pretty much every advertising and marketing publication in the world? Absolutely. So sometimes people are launching chatbots just because they know that it's early in the hype cycle and you're gonna get a lot of PR value out of it. So I wanted to go through a few case studies just to highlight how are specific brands using chatbots. I have to warn you, it is pretty early in the hype cycle. People have only started launching them last year. So nobody's really released public stats on whether this has moved the needle on sales or anything like that. But like I said, there is a clear loop that can be closed between finding a product in a chatbot and buying it online. So I think it's just a matter of time before we see those stats come out. The first one I wanted to go through is Sephora. So Sephora launched a chatbot on Kik. Their audience does tend to be younger, so they chose Kik because it's a younger messaging app. And uh, they launched a couple more on Facebook Messenger in late 2016. And really, their chatbots allowed you to do a few things. On the next slide, you can kind of see an example of what you could do. Welcome to Sephora. Get makeup tips and reviews by chatting with us. Do you want to take a short quiz so we can get to know you? Uh, so it allowed them to, to people to do a few things. First, you could book an appointment in store. So you could actually go into a Sephora location and have you know, your makeover or get product recommendations. Uh, second, they allowed you to chat and ask questions about products and read reviews. Which, I mean, think about the people that are using, that they're targeting here, teenagers. It's not as fun to tweet publicly to Sephora and say, hey, I have really bad acne, what cream should I be using? But if you're interacting with a chatbot, it's private, it's super simple, um, and it's a, lot, it's a safer space to be able to ask the questions you might not want to ask. The big question, which I don't know how to answer, is do people know they're interacting with a chatbot? I would guess no for a lot of these people, especially if they're younger and they might not have heard of chatbots. A lot of them probably think that they're chatting with an actual person, uh, which is kind of an interesting phenomena around chatbots. Uh, and in terms of stats, they haven't really released any stats on how this is actually working, but they did say that they released a survey on their Kik chatbot and that 40% of people completed it. So if you're someone who likes to do focus groups or consumer insights or new product testing, this could be a really great tool to actually find out if the people who are active with you on chatbots are into uh, what you're launching. The next one is Taco Bell which might sound random, but I feel like Domino's and Taco Bell and some of these fast food brands are actually at the forefront of tech innovation, which sounds crazy. You know, Domino's launched the ability to order a pizza with an emoji, which was really cool. Well, Taco Bell's getting into the bot game. So unsurprisingly, their bot was called Taco Bot, and it was released in Slack. They know their audience, just like Sephora knows that it's teenage girls and boys who are using Kik to message and that want to interact with them there. Taco Bell knows that most of the people using Slack are people at small businesses, they're probably a lot of developers, and they probably eat a lot of tacos. So they released something called Taco Bot, which allowed companies, teams at companies, to actually curate all of their orders together. So 10 different people could add their orders for one larger Taco Bell order, and then they would actually place the order at the Taco Bell closest to them. Them. Again, you still have to go pick up those tacos, so it's not a completely seamless experience. I'm expecting their next move to be Taco Drone that actually drops off the order to your office, but we're not quite there yet. And uh, 
It's still in private beta, so they haven't released. It's only open to a select group of companies. They're kind of trying to test how this is going to work. And that means that they also haven't released any success metrics. Have they actually sold more tacos because of the taco bot in Slack? So we don't know that yet, but we do know that they got a ton of coverage in Fortune, Wired, Ad Age, and pretty much every publication out there. Again, positioning them as a thought leader and taking advantage of the hype cycle. And the final case study is one that is very close to my heart, and it is called TiffBot. So uh, we were kind of, after I fell in love with bots, not Samantha, the actual bot, but just bots in general, uh, last spring I was kind of talking to my team about, you know, how can we actually partner up with a development team to, to build a bot? We don't have any developers on staff, so if you have any technical questions about bots, I can give you uh, Rob from TWG's email, I am not your girl. Uh, but we, we chatted with him last year and said, you know, could we, could we do something to test our theory about bots and, and build something fun? And at that point, TWG, which is a software studio in Toronto, they had only built one bot, and it was an internal Slack bot that notified employees when it was their turn to unload the dishwasher. <laughs> Very handy, not going to make them millions of dollars. Uh, although I'm sure most offices could, could take advantage of that. So we actually partnered up with, uh, with TWG, and the result was... TiffBot. He's very cute. We did the branding, we did all the marketing for him, TWG built him, and really he was addressing a pain point which we found as you know, avid movie lovers and uh, attendees of TIFF every year, the Toronto International Film Festival, where it's really hard to navigate through the schedule. No one knows what all the movies at TIFF are going to be like. They're not popular yet. No one's talking about them. So how do you actually navigate through the schedule of movies and figure out which ones you want to see, organize your schedule? So we took all of the publicly available movie information and scheduling information on TIFF's website, and we scraped it all into a bot, into the back end of a chat bot. And then we wrote really fun front-end interactions, because you do have to write all of those messages that get sent back and forth between a uh, user and the chatbot. And we built it on a tool, and by we, I mean Rob, uh, built it on a tool called ChatFuel. Sorry, if you can just go back for one second. So ChatFuel is like the WordPress for bots. So if you're not someone that has a strong development background, or you don't have $100,000 to build a, build a bot from scratch, ChatFuel is a really kind of simple solution. You'll probably still need a developer, but it takes a lot less time than building it from the ground up. So we decided to do that. Uh, and really, TiffBot actually allowed you to chat with it, uh, ask it for movie recommendations based on movie genre, based on your favorite star, based on directors, and it would chat back and forth with you. We made them really fun. So we had fun you know, GIFs that, that it would send you when you ask questions. Um, it would ask you, you know, I'm a robot film critic. It was very self-aware. Uh, it would tell you what movies you wanted to see, show you trailers, and, and you could watch them right within Messenger. It would send you to the uh, TIFF website to buy tickets once you found a movie that you liked. So it was really fun and just kind of solved a few of those pain points. Um, and we actually, you know, it's interesting thinking about the inputs. We had put in genres like drama and comedy. And the thing about chatbots, and something I'll get to in a little bit, is they have to be intuitive. Just like calling a dial-in system for Rogers and wanting to jump off a bridge because you have to you know, press one for this, press five for that. If a bot is not intuitive and doesn't understand what you're saying, it's going to be really difficult. So we had to allow for things like dramedy. Right? That's not something that TiffBot understood. And when we tested it with people at our, our companies, we realized that people were putting in different types of genres. So if you ever do build a bot, big tip, have a testing process with a small group of people and see what people are actually inputting and whether your bot knows how to respond. We also made it so that if people swore at it, it wouldn't get mad. It would just kind of write back and say, you know, that's not nice. So having a little fun with it and giving it a personality. Uh, next slide. So what are the results of TiffBot? Well, uh, first of all, we launched this without TIFF's participation or permission. So we bought filmbot.ca as a backup, just in case they sued us. But they didn't sue us. In fact, they really loved him. They approached us and formed an official partnership with us. And not only that, they added content. They added a hidden gems category to TIFFBOT chosen by TIFF employees. And this year, we're going to partner again to make TIFFBOT bigger and better. 
Uh, we launched TIFF by last August, leading up to TIFF, a few weeks before, and we had 8,600 people who actually used it and interacted with it, which is pretty good considering our market, marketing budget was about $50 of Facebook ads targeted to people in Toronto and our team at 88 Creative doing the PR. And this did resonate really well with the media, both with uh, movie and entertainment industry publications, so it was in IndieWire, the, the film critic at Rolling Stone tweeted, is TiffBot here to take my job? No, sir, we're not, but thank you for the, uh, thanks for the tweet, and in a lot of technology publications as well. So we had over a, a, a half a million unpaid media impressions from this campaign. Next slide, please. So, the big question on all of your minds other than when do we get more coffee is probably how do I actually build a bot? I'm not a developer, I don't know how to do this. So there's a, few, uh, there's a few ways that you can go about building a bot, and unfortunately right now, most of them do involve having a developer involved, but I think that will change as we move down the hype cycle and it becomes more ubiquitous. So the first is to hire a developer to build one from the ground up. If you're a Fortune 500 brand, this is probably the option that you're gonna go with because big brands wanna own their IP. And if you build it on something like ChatFuel, if ChatFuel shuts down or anything happens to the platform, so your bot is gone and so is everything that you built on it. So if you do have a larger budget, you have either an internal development team or you can outsource that to an external team, uh, number one is probably the best option for you. Uh, and especially if you're using artificial intelligence in your bot so it learns and gets smarter as people use it, you'll probably have to outsource that to a team that's experienced with that. The second option is to use built-in tools from Facebook and Microsoft. So they've launched these kind of bot framework tools that allow you to kind of go in and they guide you through the process. So you can build a very simple messenger bot for your Facebook page. If you're a local nail salon, for example, when you go to a Facebook page now, it says chat with us. So if you have uh, a Facebook messenger bot, you can either chat in real time as a human or you can kind of program it to have automated responses when you're open, when you're closed, all of that kind of stuff. And the third option is to use a bot platform like ChatFuel, which is what we use for TiffBot, which is really like the WordPress for chatbots. So should you build a bot? The million dollar question. More like the $100,000 question if you're building one from scratch. Uh, so should you build a bot? You should build a bot if you want to improve your customer service. Uh, so if you have a, t a big issue with customer service, you have a huge customer service team and you're looking to automate part of it. You should build one if your brand app is lagging. If you spent, I, I'm, I feel for you if this is you, if you spent a lot of money on developing a mobile app and nobody is using it. This is a really great alternative and to test out and see if it's hanging out on a platform where your customers already are helps with some of that usage. You should build one if you're selling a product. Like I said, all of these e-commerce companies are really jumping on board with bots. Uh, if you want to position your brand as bleeding edge, TiffBot solved a problem, sure, but we didn't save lives. It wasn't a huge problem. You could have gone on TIFF's website. Um, you, you can just launch a bot because you want PR headlines or you want to build some buzz or position yourself like Taco Bell as an early adopter in technology. Uh, you can build a bot if you have a rich data set. So don't forget that for every interaction that the bot has with you, someone has to write that interaction, but there also has to be data on the back end. So one of the clients we work with at 88 Creative is Yellow Pages. And they would be an amazing candidate for a bot because they have information and tons of data points on every small business across Canada that they've been collecting for the last 50 years. So being able to actually take that data and program it into the back of a, bo a bot is really awesome. So if you have a, a multiple products in your product catalog or a ton of content, a content library, bots would be great for you. And finally, if you want to easily guide people through your product or service, so think about product tutorials or customer onboarding, a bot can be a really great way to do that. And next, um, how do you make your bot successful? Okay, so you've decided, you know, I'm gonna build a bot for my online store. How do you actually get people to use it? Well, first, you have to make sure it solves a customer problem. Again, not if you're just doing it for buzz, but make sure it does solve a customer problem. Uh, you know, they want to get news before anyone else. They want to know breaking news the second it happens. They, um, you know, they're having trouble navigating through your thousands of products and they want some help getting guided down the path to purchase. Uh, and if it's not solving a customer problem, if it's just like TiffBot and it's solving, sure, a little bit of a problem, but it's really just a fun thing, make it shareable and engaging and fun. TiffBot had funny gifts, he had a personality, he made jokes. That's a great example of that. 
Make it intuitive. I can't stress this enough. There's nothing worse than interfacing, and the biggest criticism by the media and by people in the industry about chatbots is that they don't always understand what you're saying, and they can be a really frustrating experience to use. So make it intuitive. Test it with people to make sure that your bot isn't going to frustrate people more than it delights them. Uh, make sure it has a personality. TiffBot had one. You can see that uh, American Eagles did. It really talked in millennial speak to, to tie in with its audience. So make sure the personality of the chatbot matches the personality of your brand. Choose the right medium. Should you be building it on Facebook Messenger? Should you be building it on Kick? Should you be building it on SMS because you have a bit of an older audience? Figure out who the, tar the demographic is that's using that specific messaging tool, and then you know, choose the one that matches with your own target customers. And finally, test multiple inputs so it's not frustrating, because nobody wants to end up like Seinfeld and Kramer saying, why don't you just tell me the name of the movie that you want to see? It's never a seamless experience for anyone. If you're too young to get that reference, I hate you. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. OK, so I wanted to finish off. I have exactly four minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, I wanted to finish off by talking about the risks of bots, and not the risk that you'll fall in love with it, like Joaquin Phoenix and her, um, and not the risk that the robots will take over our jobs but the publicity and PR risk of going out with a bot that goes rogue. So I have two examples here. One is, the, on the left, is Microsoft. So Microsoft really is on the bleeding edge of bots. Uh, they're doing a ton of work in artificial intelligence, and they had the great idea to create a millennial-focused bot called Tay. And Tay was powered by artificial intelligence, which meant that she had a brain and learned as people interacted with her. And they launched Tay on Twitter, and as people interacted with Tay, she would write things back to them and have conversations. But the one thing that Microsoft didn't account for is that people are jerks. And so they started saying racist things to Tay. And so Tay learned all of this and then would parrot back responses like, we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. Very quickly, Microsoft had to pull Tay off of, the, off of Twitter, so that wasn't great. Uh, the second example over here is, is Coca-Cola, poor Coca-Cola. They had only the best of intentions. Uh, they launched something called the Happiness Project, which was taking negative tweets that people had sent out on Twitter and turning the actual words and letters into fun balloon animal style drawings. Kind of a nice idea, until some clever Twitter user, and by clever I mean jerky Twitter user, signed up and tweeted line by line every word of Mein Kampf by Hitler, and Coca-Cola inadvertently tweeted out the whole book. Uh, so again, not great for them, and they had to, to remove it. So I guess my lesson here isn't don't build a bot, it's that remember that people are jerks. They're going to swear at your bot, they're going to try to get it to say funny things, they're going to treat it as a game. Uh, next slide, and just to, to highlight the Tay example, The Economist wrote that one of Microsoft's bots, Tay, designed to impersonate a millennial, started parroting racist language it had learned from users on Twitter. Tay had to be sent to her digital room. <laughs> so I wanted to finish off with a slide that I think is kind of predicting the future of bots. You might not understand bots today, you might not care about them, but this slide should be something that sticks in your memory for the next couple of years. Uh, just like your business had a phone number in the 80s, just like it had a website in the 1990s uh, or early 2000s, and just like it had a mobile app in the last 10 to 15 years, every business will have a chatbot in the next five to 10 years. Just like social media, you know, back in 2007, everyone was asking the question, uh, should I sign up for social media? Now the question is when, not if. It's going to be the same for chatbots. So you might not launch one today, but at least put it into your head, sit down with your team, talk about where you might be able to add one to your business, and, uh, and hopefully you will be at the start of the hype curve and not at the end. So thank you. I'd love to chat bots, so get in touch with me anytime.